Hi, my name is Rob, and this is the quantitative PCR lecture. The lecture will be broken down into four separate sessions. The first session, session one, is introduction to quantitation methods. The four sessions that will make up the quantitative PCR lecture are one, introduction to quantitation methods, two, an overview of qPCR, three, instrumentation and software, and four, plate preparation and data analysis. In the first session, Introduction to Quantitation Methods, we will be going over the following topics. Why quantitate DNA? Why use human-specific assays? The benefits of using both autosomal and Y-specific assays? PCR nomenclature, other quantitation methods, and a very brief history of qPCR. Let's start off with why quantitate DNA. Quantitation shows how much DNA is available for amplification. Commonly, DNA that results from extractions may have to be concentrated or diluted before amplification can take place. Also, quantitation can assist in the troubleshooting during the analysis process. Commercial amplification kits are designed to give best results within a narrow DNA quantity range, typically between 0.5 to 2.0 nanograms. The kit components are optimized for a certain amount of input DNA. Too much or too little input DNA will adversely affect data interpretation. We will briefly go over some of the common problems associated with too much input DNA. These are high stutter, pull up, and split peaks from minus A. These will be gone into in more detail later in your training. High stutter. High stutter is caused by off-scale data. Off-scale data occurs when the quantity of DNA present is more than the highest level that the CCD camera of the instrument can detect. First, let's go into what is stutter. Stutter is a small peak that is four base pairs less than the main peak. This is a known artifact and it is seen in data. From the diagram at the side, you can see where the two stutter peaks, those small peaks in blue, are labeled, and they correspond to their main peaks, which are also in the same color blue dye. The peak height of stutter varies, but it is approximately 15% of the main peak. The software knows the percentage of the stutter peak and determines if the small peak is a stutter peak or if it is not. If it is a stutter peak, it is filtered out and not assigned an allele call. If data is off scale, the true height of the main peak is not known. Therefore, the software cannot accurately calculate the stutter peak's percentage of the main peak. And in situations like this, the stutter peak may be labeled as a true peak. For example, if the stutter at the locus D3S1358 is 10%, then any peak four base pairs before the main peak with a height of 10% or less than the main peak is determined to be stutter and therefore is not assigned an allele call. When dealing with off-scale data, for example, a peak that is really 10,000 RFUs high but the highest peak height the software can detect is 8,000 RFUs, the stutter peak which is 10% of the true peak height will be at 1,000 RFUs. The software looks at the stutter peak and determines that it is more than 10% of the main peak. This is because the software thinks the main peak is only 8,000 RFUs because that is the highest level it can detect. As a result, it will assign the stutter peak an allele call. In mixture interpretations, this can cause problems when trying to sort out contributors. Now let's go into pull up. Pull up is when a peak of one color is seen under a peak of another color. The dyes used in the kits have wavelengths of fluorescence that overlap, and this is known as spectral overlap. The software is able to correct for the spectral overlap between the dyes. From the graph, the areas that are in common to the dyes are the areas where spectral overlap would occur. The closer the dyes are to their wavelengths to each other, the more spectral overlap occurs between those dyes. The calculation of expected spectral overlap is based on regular peak heights. The spectral overlap that is not corrected for is visible in analyzed data and is called pull-up. The diagram shows a small peak in blue which is pull-up that resulted from the green peak and also a small peak in green that was pull-up that resulted from the yellow peak. With off-scale data, the spectral overlap is greater than the values calculated by the software. Therefore, the software subtracts out the expected amount of spectral overlap but some of it remains and it is seen as a small peak under a main peak and it can be assigned an allele call. This diagram shows pull up in the yellow dye from the off-scale peak in the green dye. It is important to notice 
that the pull-up peak, which is much smaller, is lined up directly under the main peak that is causing it to be pulled up. Now let's talk about minus A. Reagents in PCR have a tendency to add a 3' nuclear tail at the end of amplified DNA. This is the adenine nucleotide that is added on. The whole time, which is at the end of the PCR, is to ensure that all of the amplified DNA is given time for the addition of the poly A3' tail by the reagents. This ensures that all peak heights are uniform. All peak heights are now considered to be plus A because there is the addition of the adenine tail. If there is too much input DNA, then there is not enough time for the addition of the adenine nucleotide to all of the amplified DNA. This may result in a peak showing up in the data that is one base pair shorter than the main peak. DNA without the adenine nucleotide tail is one base pair shorter than the main peak and is referred to as minus A because it is lacking the A nucleotide. This can appear as either shoulder peak as shown in the diagram, two separate peaks, or a split peak. Here we have a diagram where the minus A is causing there to be two separate peaks. Notice that the both peaks are only one base pair apart. Minus A can also appear as a split peak where basically the top of the peak instead of having one point will have two points. At the other end of the scale there are common problems associated with too little DNA. You can end up with no data, low level data, lack of amplification of some loci, locus imbalance and allelic dropout. No data simply means there is not enough DNA input into the PCR reaction and therefore you get a negative result. Low level data means that peaks are seen, but not enough DNA was present for the peaks to cross the minimum threshold and be assigned an allele call. Lack of amplification of some loci occurs with small amounts of DNA. Smaller loci are amplified and larger loci may not be amplified. This can result in a partial profile or the profile may erroneously appear to be from degraded DNA. The diagram shows that the peak heights of the smaller loci which come off first are much higher than the peak heights of the larger loci which come off later. Locus imbalance occurs when there is unbalanced amplification of two alleles at a locus. This is caused when there is too little input DNA and there are stochastic fluctuations in the ratio of the two different alleles. Allelic dropout occurs when an entire allele is missing from a profile. This can result in a heterozygote showing up as a homozygote. This diagram shows the same profile. The top part of the diagram is with the correct amount of input DNA, and the bottom part of the diagram is what occurs when too little DNA was input into the system. Here you can see that allelic dropout occurred at the VWA locus, and there was a locus imbalance that occurred at the D21 locus. Problems caused by too little or too much DNA are not realized until data interpretation. This causes a waste of time and resources to repeat the process. If an evidence sample was consumed in the first attempt, then the process cannot be repeated. Other uses of quantitation. It may determine if other amplification methods are appropriate for the testing. Example LCN, low copy number, or mini STR testing. These can be employed if the DNA quantity is too small. Quantitation can be used to troubleshoot data. It can be used to check the optimal amount of DNA for new assays. And some quantitation methods can target specific types of DNA, Y or mitochondrial testing. DNA quantitation can also be used for troubleshooting. A problem with DNA analysis is generally not seen until the profile is developed in the last stage of the DNA process. It must then be determined at what point the problem occurred in the analysis process. Problems can occur at several points, and troubleshooting the entire process is very time consuming. An accurate and reliable means of quantitation will reduce the time for troubleshooting, because that will indicate that all processes performed before the quantitation, which are the screening and extraction processes, were done properly. Why use human-specific assays? Crime scenes are not clean, pristine areas. DNA from non-human sources are usually present, example bacterial or animal DNA. Human-specific assays will only target human DNA, so other DNA does not affect your results. 
In the DNA audit document, it requires laboratories to determine the quantity of human DNA. This is outlined in the DAB standard 9.3. Benefits of using both autosomal and Y-specific assays. When amplifying total human DNA, if there is too much of one person's DNA, then it is possible for that person's DNA to mask the presence of the DNA from the other individual. This is commonly seen with vaginal swabs, where the female DNA will overpower the male DNA if there are only a few cells from the male present. This can result in a single source profile or the profile from the other person being too low to be of any use. Benefits of using both autosomal and Y-specific assays. This is beneficial in most crimes involving a male and a female. Evidence samples taken directly from the body of a female will typically have a lot of female cells. If the female DNA is in a much greater quantity than the male, then during total human amplification, there may be little or no amplification of the male DNA. This can lead to a false negative result. Why specific assays can target only male DNA regardless of how much female DNA is present. This is beneficial in the following scenarios. A sexual assault where semen is present but little or no sperm cells are present, especially on vaginal swabs. A mixture of male and female blood at the scene or on the female where the female bled a lot more than the male. The transfer of saliva from male onto a female when swabbing the skin of a female, it is possible to remove a lot of female epithelial cells in the process, and also with fingernail scrapings. In these cases, amplification with a YSTR kit may be more beneficial to the case depending on the ratio of quantities of total human to Y DNA. Y quantitation is usually done along with total human quantitation. Because when deciding how much DNA is needed for amplification, the quantity of total human DNA is used. If the ratio of human to male is too high, then conventional amplification may not be sufficient to bring up the male profile. Using Y quantifier as a screening tool, there are typically a high number of sexual assault cases. The screening process is lengthy. There is presumptive testing, which is then followed by confirmatory tests. Some laboratories do a quick extraction of a small amount of evidence samples and then quantitate them with total human and Y kits. If male DNA is present, then the evidence is put through the full screening process. If there is no male DNA, then no more work on that piece of evidence is needed. Now let's go over some PCR nomenclature. qPCR is known as quantitative PCR. This usually implies using PCR for DNA quantitation in real time not endpoint. RT-PCR stands for real-time PCR, but in other fields it can stand for reverse transcriptase PCR, and often it is used in conjunction with real-time PCR. Amplicon is the product of PCR. Calibrant DNA is the DNA of a known concentration that is serially diluted to prepare a standard curve. This can also be called standard DNA. Baseline is a linear function subtracted from the data to eliminate background signal. The threshold is a value selected when the PCR is in the exponential phase of growth. CT, the cycle threshold, this is the cycle number at which the amplification curve crosses the selected threshold value. And E stands for efficiency, and this is a measure relating to the rate of PCR amplification. We will now go over some other quantitation methods. That is UV, yield gels, aliquant, quantablot, picogreen fluorescence, cybergreen, which is a form of real-time PCR quantitation. Let us begin with the UV method. The UV method uses a spectrophotometer equipped with a UV lamp. The absorbance readings are performed at 260 nanometers where DNA absorbs light most strongly. From the number generated, the amount of DNA can be estimated. This is because 1 OD, which is optical density, which is the absorbance value for the DNA, is equal to 50.0 nanograms per milliliter of double-stranded DNA. Some of the problems with the UV method. It is not very sensitive. It consumes a lot of forensic specimen. Absorbance measurements are not specific for human DNA. 
it can also be influenced by contaminating proteins. And phenol, which is left over from extraction procedures, like organic extractions, can give falsely high signals. With the yield gel method, the DNA is loaded onto a gel. The gel is then stained with ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide intercalates in the DNA molecule and fluoresces on the UV light. Then this fluorescence of the sample is compared to fluorescence given off from DNA samples of known concentrations. The problems with using yield gel, once again it is also not very sensitive. It consumed a lot of sample and it was not specific to human DNA. The aliquant quantitation method is an assay that probes allu repeats that are in high abundance in the human genome. Probe target hybridization initiates a series of enzymatic reactions that end in the production of ATP and the oxidation of luciferin resulting in the production of light. The light intensity is then read by a luminometer and is proportional to the amount of DNA. Sample quantities are determined by comparison to a standard curve. Problems that occurred with the aliquant system was that it was not able to detect the presence of inhibitors and it did not give accurate results for degraded samples. The quantiblot, also known as the slot blot procedure, uses a probe that is complementary to a primate-specific alpha satellite DNA sequence called D17Z1, which is located on chromosome 17. It can either use a chemiluminescent or a colorimetric detection with TMB. The DNA is immobilized to a nylon membrane, then complementary sequences bind the biotinylated probe. On the probe is streptovidin horseradish peroxidase conjugate. Streptovidin horseradish peroxidase conjugate either oxidizes a luminol-based reagent, and that's going to give you a chemiluminescent detection, and that emits photons, or it oxidizes tetramethylbenzidine to produce a blue color, and this is your colorimetric detection. The quantity of DNA is then determined by visual comparison between samples and a series of standards run along with samples. The diagram below shows the point at which the probe attaches to the membrane and also it shows where the reaction takes place to give off your chemiluminescent detection. Problems with the quantum blood system was that results were subjective because you were visually comparing intensity of color from sample to standards and people may vary on their interpretation of the results. In some cases, a reader was used to reduce the subjectivity of the testing. Also, the method was extremely time-consuming and labor-intensive process, and it was not able to detect any PCR inhibitors. The picogreen fluorescence method uses picogreen, which is a fluorescent intercalating dye whose fluorescence is greatly enhanced when bound to double-stranded DNA. The quantitation is then done by comparison to a standard curve which was constructed from standards. The problems with this is that it was not specific for human DNA. CyberGreen Real-Time PCR Quantitation The CyberGreen system works by the detection of fluorescence given off by the CyberGreen dye as it binds with double-stranded DNA. The method uses human-specific primers for ALU sequences. The more double-stranded DNA that builds up from PCR, the more fluorescence that is given off. The only real problem with the CyberGreen system is that it binds to double-stranded DNA and some extraction methods leave DNA in a single-stranded form. Now let's go over a brief history of qPCR. qPCR is a recently developed technique. It was developed by Higuchi in 1993. He used a modified thermal cycler with a UV detector and a CCD camera. Ethidium bromide was used as an intercalating reporter dye, and as the concentration of double-stranded DNA increased, so did the fluorescence. On this slide is the reference information for the first paper on qPCR. This is the end of session one.